Mm. Oh, Sue. Mm. Frank, not now. Okay, suit yourself. How about now? Why can't Mom make dinner? Ask her. She's the one who abandoned her post. I'm not working. That means I'm not a man. Oh, man, don't hurt me. Yeah, you better run from me. Well, I'm afraid of your wife, you out of work pussy fart. I'll do whatever it takes to put bread on the table. Meet our vice president of marketing. Hey, you, Sue. How fast can you type? I don't care. I can stare at that rack all day. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. I am not my father. Oh, you need to hit the baby. Whoa, he's sucking the shit out of that baby. Dada? You and I are in trouble and we need to talk to somebody. We don't need a goddamn priest. Oh. Are you fighting again? No. no. Everything's fine, princess. Now just go downstairs, watch your cartoons, and mind your own damn business. Where the is Frank Murphy at? I'm picking him up for work. Did somebody get shot? I saw a black guy in a truck. I hate you! <laughs> Ain't she something, Frank? She makes me think about getting a car, filling up with little ones. Dad, you said you'd take me to hockey tryouts at 10.30. Christ, so how many kids do we have? Back in the old days, the good Lord had the decency to take one or two out with polio. Something to help out! How you doing? How you doing? Sir. Can these people see us as they walk by? I think it's tinted, but yeah, they okay. can, they can so kind of see That'd be weird, huh? <laughs> it's like a well, Good Day show, you know? Crouch a little so they can't see us? Yeah, those sad people who show up to the Good Day show at like <laughs> five in the morning, just With stand the there. signs? Yeah, hoping Ethel sees them. It's like from Kansas all the time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for being here. I love this show. You're oh, one of my you. favorite comedians. I'm excited to talk to you. Well, I'm excited to be here. These chairs are horrific. <laughs> this is like, this is designed for like, I don't know what age. It's not like six to eight, like when you're 11. This is like the perfect size. It's not quite adult size. It's not kid size. I already slouch. It's gonna I be a slouch. bad interview, dude. And I'm blaming the chair. I slouch or go down like this or All right. cross the legs. Uh, Bill, you're, are you the head writer on the show, or how do you, how do you work in the writer's room on the show? Because you write your stand-up specials, you know, obviously you're a writer, but you've never really written on a sitcom before if you go through your credits. You hadn't really been on a show before. Why'd you have to bring that up? <laughs> Just right out of the gate, he goes negative. <laughs> never really saw you write on anything before, Bill. Um, <laughs> there was all these other th nice things on your IMDb page I could have brought up, but I noticed this one glaring thing that you've never done. And right out of the gate. Was it because I made fun of the, the chairs? I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, no, I'm not the head writer. Mike Price, the great Mike Price. I have to say that he beats me in the writer's room. The great Mike Price from uh, um, The Simpsons. He's the head guy. And I'm just, I'm one of 10 in there, pitching jokes and that type of stuff. So um, yeah, that's what I do in there. Were you nervous? I'll be getting... sure to have that on my IMDb page for the next time. <laughs> no, I, I, I love the show, and I was wondering if you were nervous getting in there with a group of writers, since you've been sort of the, the lone writer of all of your work for so long. Oh, no, I, by no means did I want to do this by myself. I mean, you need all of that help. Like, I had an idea to do something like this on my website, just do little five-minute vignettes, because... Uh, I used to tell family stories when I first started out doing stand-up and everybody laughed when I was the young comic. And then as it became the older comic, you know, and the helicopter kids came in and everything was labeled and people wore helmets when they rode bicycles and everything was considered bullying. Those same stories didn't get laughs anymore. Everybody was sort of groaning like, oh, oh, you know. I'd be like, no, this was funny. I deserve to get beaten for that. <laughs> so that's when I decided, well, if I animate these things and... Um, I'm a comedian, so I never did it because I have other jobs that I can do to make money. So <laughs> it wasn't until I got with Mike Price, he turned it into a show. Vince Vaughn's company, too. And what was your initial... I mean, so was this the idea that you initially had going into it, that it would look like this? And no. I had no idea what it was going to look like. Um, this was like... I just, you know, I actually decided to do a, a, a cartoon because you can get away with more. And also, I did like those one-camera shoots, and those people work like 12, 14-hour days. There's hair, makeup, and wardrobe. So I thought I was being smart doing an animated show. 
thinking, oh, this will be easy. You know, they just do a little Flintstone shit, you know? I'll come in and say a couple of goofy things into a mic, and I'll go back out, you know, go see a movie or something. And it's not quite how it works. So this alone, just trying to come up with the look of it, which you wouldn't think, it took us like, we spent like, I swear, felt like six weeks on noses and eyes. Because you have to have everybody look. It's a weird thing, like animation. Well, it sets like, up the world. Yeah, but you have to come up with like your race of like animated people, you know? <laughs> so like... <laughs> So, like, the Simpsons have the mustard yellow people with the giant eyes. The Simpsons have, like, the Pac-Man heads. So you got to kind of come up with your own thing that hasn't been done before. So I hope we did. We tried to have, like, a... seven. We wanted the 70s look the way most of my friends remember it. I mean, the way Hollywood does the 70s is everybody looked like Ron Burgundy or the Bee Gees or something. And that was, you know, that was a group of people. And everybody drove a pacer, which they didn't. I remember when that car came out, me and my wife was like, that was the... I mean, me and my mother. What the hell's wrong with me? So that was the ugliest piece of shit I've ever seen. Sorry. I went out to a diner till like four in the morning last night. Um, I got into an argument over music. This kid was trying to tell me that the Foo Fighters were better than the Beatles, and I just couldn't handle that. Wait, what? Let's stick to yeah. this for a second, if you don't mind. Who the hell was arguing with you that the Foo he Fighters said were better that, than the Beatles? He said he didn't like the Beatles because they didn't, and when I listened to their music, he goes, it doesn't make me want to get on an elliptical. Like, this is how this guy judges music. Like, if it makes him want to work out. So, like, with that analogy, it's just like, hey, I don't like Mozart, because it doesn't make me want to grab ankle weights. You know, I don't even, I, and, and like an idiot, I actually argued with this person. Like, they're that far down the boulevard. Like, I was going to bring them somewhere to where I was. And my eggs were getting cold, and I stayed in it. It was such a waste of time. It's just one of those days you wake up at like noon hating yourself. Like I, I'm decades beyond having these things happen to me. And how I did you? It. How did you argue with that? If it started there, loudly, how did you loudly argue about upsetting it? other people? I vaguely remember saying to some guy there, like, because he was giving me shit for how loud I was being. I finally said to the guy, "Go, dude, who the fuck orders spaghetti at a diner?" <laughs> and I didn't hear another word out of him, so I was proud of that. The one person who's excited for the huge menu orders spaghetti. You know? Yeah, at some point I was going to make a point here. That's why I keep looking at here and I just realize I'm blocking myself out of the camera. I love that you have the jib camera for this, like it's an action movie. <laughs> let's, let's, let's swoop in at these two guys sitting in these unbelievably small chairs. I literally feel like I'm going to fall onto the floor. This is insane. You really went all out with the audience, though. They got full-size adult chairs. <laughs> Are these like from the 20s before they had like horse tranquilizers in our food when everybody was like five foot one? Yeah, da 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 All right. Bill, I loved, I loved your, last, uh, your last special that was on Netflix uh, yep. recently. You shot that before the election, I was, and it ended up airing after the election. Yep. What was that like? It was stupid. I should have waited till after the election. I didn't never dawn on me because I don't pay attention to politics. Right, I don't now? care. I don't care. No. Really? You shouldn't pay attention. Like, if look, if you're a minority or you're an immigrant, you should pay attention. But if you're just some just run of the mill white guy running around, you know, I don't have enough money to give to Trump for him to pay attention to me. You know what I mean? You know that Illuminati level where they pay like nine grand for, for fucking eggs? You know, and then afterwards you go up and shake his hand and say, oh, you want to put a pipeline through a teepee, right? And he, and he lets it happen because you gave him all those money for eggs, right? Titans of industry. Yeah, and then afterwards, then they all go out and they, then they do the speech circuit. And that's how they all make money. They go back to the guys that bought the eggs eight years earlier, right? And they give their stupid speeches, right? Is there people in the crowd are eating like a deep fried eagle, right? They don't care about America. And... Uh, no, that's what kills me about Obama. All the stuff they're showing him, like he's this hero, you know what I mean? Every like picture of him now, he's always like kayaking. You know? <laughs> Looks like an erectile dysfunction ad. You know? Like this guy didn't do like he didn't do all these drone bombings. Like, were those terrorists? Were they playing hacky sack? I don't know. You want some soft shell crab? You know, like he wasn't part of that. Sorry, so this is why I don't I don't talk politics, because I'm into conspiracy theory, man. Are you really? I'm into it, yeah. How do Alex Jones deep, or? I think that whoever runs this is a robot and didn't like map out what human beings are shaped like, which is why they, they sort of had an idea of what chairs were. And that's what they, <laughs> <laughs> so this, this show is making me paranoid. No, I don't do like that the moon is made out of cheese or anything like that. I just think people are inherently evil. And if they get, if they get the opportunity, 
to take more, they're going to do it. And I think, yeah, I think that that's what's going on. So no, don't pay attention to politics because it's not. There's nothing that you. Can really I tried do. to watch that guy testifying today. That was one of the most boring things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's like, why don't they just say it? Like, did the Russians fuck with the election? They don't. They go on oh, September sixth at uh, eleven a.m. I would just just. He you know, just like. I think they do that on purpose so no one pays attention. And then somewhere in the. They sort of whisper it like nine hours in. Did the Russians fuck with it? Oh, okay. And then they just sort of plow through. Was that what it was about? Wasn't it about that? Something like that. They head of the FBI or something? Yeah, James Comey, the former director of the FBI. I just know he's 6'8", which was hilarious. Humongous. I just pictured him in the police academy, like when he had to go over that giant wall, him just like stepping over it. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to buy like one of those custom sweatshirts. Huge legs. <laughs> yeah, at some point, aren't you too tall to be a cop? You can't be using me on undercover. Just his whole head sticking out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> What's with that seven-foot guy over there who keeps following us around? I'm starting to feel like uh, you can't blend in at 6'8", right? You can't do a stakeout at all? No. So going back to the special, you said that you, know, you felt like it was a mistake because you shouldn't cover politics. Does that mean that there's no politics in the future of any of your specials at all? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I might... Uh, if something... like I, The bit I'm doing now is I talk about Hillary because I'm like fascinated not by who wins, it's like by who loses. Just the level of fame that you had, you know, and everybody caring and there's news trucks and all that and all of a sudden the second you lose, as you're giving your speech, like, you know, we fought a good fight and they're like wrapping up wire and all the, all the vans are driving away. It's like, it's like you were in sync and you weren't Justin Timberlake. So then you got to wait for his movie career to dip so you can do a cruise or some shit. Um, and it just Going fascinates me that that dream didn't come true and she's married to a guy where it did come true. And they got to be in the same house. And the tension of that, it's just got to be excruciating. And he's arguably one of the reasons that she might have lost as well. Yeah, because she didn't involve him. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean because she That's didn't like when him. the Rams didn't, didn't give the ball to Marshall Falk. It's like, why wouldn't you do that? This guy's a, he's a beast. He had the job for eight years. He got impeached. They still couldn't kick him out. He fucks around all the time, and women still love him. I mean, the guy, is, he's like bulletproof. Yeah. You already saw Al Gore not loot, use him and lose. Why would you do that again? Stupid move. <laughs> Stupid move. Yeah, and then they tried to blame racist white people. That was the dumbest theory ever. It's like, where were all those racists the last two elections when they could have voted against a black guy? They were fine with that, but this white woman is going to take my jet skis, right? <laughs> I love this dude texting for the entire interview. It's just, it's just trying to keep the attentions of millennials. It's like impossible. Look at him. He's already got the chains. He's probably got his own record label. He's like making deals. As we speak, he's got championship rings on. I don't know what you're doing, dude, but I want your life, man. You're crushing it. So are you in the process? I cannot get comfortable in this fucking chair. This is just like one of the worst things. This should be like in a museum, is like the prototype. This is what, <laughs> this was the awful level of comfort. We went from a log to this, and then eventually they got cushions. It's another guy looking at his phone. I swear to God. Dude, the day Jesus comes back, if he ever does, if he's even a real person, like 90% of people are gonna miss it. They're gonna walk right, he's gonna be walking on water and they're immediately walking by him. They're not even gonna see it. Oh yeah, and there's a drop off in fame for Jesus at that point. Everyone was, everyone was paying attention, now no one gives a shit. Oh, there we go. No, but now this is like the ego one. Now I'm gonna be sitting above you. Yeah, you gotta no, come man. with two. It's fine, it's fine. Sir, the one... The one comedy through line that's working here is me shitting on this chair. Why would you take that from me? This is, you're just totally going against the grain. I understand it. But you got on camera, so I think you get paid, even though this is online. <laughs> are, you in the, are you in the process of working on new material for a new special? How often do you do specials at this point? Do you do one a year? No, I, I do them every couple of years. I do them when I feel like, you know, I'm, when I, you, get, you gotta get to a point of being sick of your act, but not in a, in a really bad way. It's like, I'd say, you know when you're gonna break up with someone, but you still need like another 60 days, they got a birthday coming up, you're like, oh, I can't do it this month. <laughs> 
You gotta get to that level with your act. Where you're like, all right, man, I gotta, uh, I gotta, I gotta dump these jokes and uh, move on. All right, so are you are you working on new material and building up to that to that point where you're sick of yeah. it? Yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm working on it, and uh, you know, I became a dad for the first time. Uh, Congratulations! Anyway, I love it. I'm, I'm gonna say that for the rest of my life. If you guys like hearing other human beings applaud for you, just always just say that. You know, I just became a parent. Every day. <laughs> Wait, I have, I, I have a, a question in regards to just becoming a dad. One of my favorite bits of material that you did, I thought it was one of the ballsiest pieces of material that you did, was in a few specials ago when you talked about how women praise each other all the time for, for being mothers. And they say, being a mother is the hardest job out Most there. Difficult Most difficult job, and difficult. Oprah said that. Oprah said that, yeah. Has, yeah. That, has your opinion on that, on that phrase changed at all since, since no. you've had a kid? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not the most difficult job on the planet. It just isn't. Dude, I did roofing in July. I almost, as a redhead, I almost died. There's people, there's people that work on like oil. What was that movie that guy made? The oil, the, the fucking, you know, they there drill will be blood. oil. What is it? There will be blood. With Not the... there will be blood. The, uh, out in the ocean, they would drill. I can never remember the names. Deepwater. Mark Wahlberg yeah, was Deepwater there. Deepwater Horizon, yeah. yeah, yeah. Those guys were working on, on an oil rig. The fucking thing blows up. <laughs> They're on fire. They gotta jump into water that's on fire. <laughs> Salty water into their wounds. You gotta swim out of that oil and fire and then tread water. Praying to God that the Coast Guard is gonna get there before the sharks do. <laughs> now talk to me about a toddler. Oh, he was so fussy today. I just, he wouldn't eat his peas. Yeah, and just the level of reward that is, you know, as annoying as a kid is, like, they smile at you and it's over. It's over. So, I mean, you, you don't get that, you know, working on an oil rig when your buddy's greasy face lights up. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It really is all worth it. No, it's just, it's pandering. It's pandering to the same way I just said I'm gonna, I just became a dad to get the applause. I liked it. Um... <laughs> I'm going to take the subway out here. I'm just going to yell that on the platform like a crazy person. Just became a dad. <laughs> How's it been so far? It's been great. It's been, uh, it's been nothing but great. I, you know, just, you know, instant love, lover to death. And um, the only thing that's been bad is just other parents. I don't like talking to other parents, generally speaking. They just can't shut up about their kids. And they think everything about their kids is fascinating while they don't give a shit about your kid. And they can never... <laughs> put themselves into your position and be like, oh, wait a minute, he doesn't give a shit about my kid. You, just, you gotta wrap it up quick. How's your kid? Ah, oh, great, just started smiling, sitting up on himself. Go ahead. I'm sitting up by himself, I should say, not on himself. <laughs> sit, sit, sitting up by himself. Now you talk about your kid and then shut up about it. What you know you... what's the worst is when somebody has a kid like a year or two older and then they just start going like, oh, I'm telling you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna tell you in, in a month from now. Enjoy this period. And they try to bring all this anxiety. That's a big thing parents do. They try to bring anxiety of, on, like, what's going to happen and all that. So now when people do that, I just say to them, this is my line. I go, you sound like a terrible father, and I think you married the wrong person. <laughs> it's like, no, it's like, that's what you got out of it? This the most amazing thing is like, oh, you can't drink anymore. You can't go out partying, which you totally can. I don't recommend it, but you really can do whatever you You can do blow right in front of your kid. I mean, what is it? <laughs> It's a baby, it doesn't know what cocaine is. And even if it did, its hands are too small to use the phone to rat you out, so. <laughs> as long as you don't teach the kid how to use the phone, you ought to be able to do blow for his whole, <laughs> for his whole like, first eight years of his life. So he figures out how to open up a window and get out the world. He's a horrible person, he snorts all the sugar. He won't, let, he won't let me pick up things. This is the only way you can be comfortable in these fucking chairs. This is like in the middle of my back. Oh my God, I love you, but I hate this set. <laughs> this is the lowest budget shit. You know what it is, it's the rent. It's the fucking rent. You did all this stuff. You should get rid of that camera and get some chairs. What, what kind of chair would you prefer? Comfortable, adult sized <laughs> chair. No, I have bad posture, that's what it is. So do I to lean to the side like this. All right. All right. My biggest fear about having kids is, that, is having those conversations with other parents where they're just spouting all those cliches that you've heard 
all the time. Like, this is going to happen to your kid, or yeah. this is what I prescribe for your kid, or this is how you should parent. And That's stuff why like I that. love people who don't have kids now. I love meeting somebody that doesn't have a kid and say that I have a kid, and they just go, oh, that's great, man. You having a good time? Yes. Yeah. Over. <laughs> Over. <laughs> There's not much more to add. No, because then they, they start talking about schools and like how I guess all the public schools are like knife fights now for evidently. I don't know what they're talking about, but so you got to get your kids and you, know, you got to start early and it's going to cost 90 grand. You know, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to homeschool my kid. Just make it a complete freak. <laughs> just fill it up my, with my theories or something. I don't know well, what I'm going to do. Conspiracy yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's mostly just lessons about conspiracy theories Actually, in the Machiavelli. I hate people like that when they don't have their dog on a leash like trying to show off like that. Look at that fucking thing. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're the dog. But why would you do that? You know what I mean? They want to smell other dogs. If it meets another dog that's a maniac, then it's in a fight. Then you got to break it up. It's very irresponsible. Can I open the window and yell you're going to be a terrible mother? <laughs> I don't know why. They, I don't mean any of this. I'm just mad at myself for staying out so late last night. I should have worked out. I can't, fucking I can't loser, believe you stayed man. out so late to argue with someone who uses I, their elliptical as a basis for their taste in music. I know. I know. I, you know, you have a couple of beers, it, it messes with your judgment. If I was stone sober, I would have been like, this isn't worth getting into. I just would have done the eyebrows up, like, mm. I, just, I would have gone back to my eggs, and I didn't. And I'll never live that down. And that's what I'm here to confess. Um, so anyways, we got 10 episodes, by the way, of this show. <laughs> And uh, we did six the first season. If you have children, do not watch it in front of your children. If you're texting your uh, wife now, sir, just let her know. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, not, not to watch it in front. I wouldn't watch it in front of kids. I love the show. I love the first season. I, I love the first episode of the, the second season. I can't wait to watch more of it. Okay. Uh, what, 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 what did you want to do differently with this season? Was there something that you guys did in the first six episodes, in the six episodes of the first season that you wanted to course correct or change or a, a place you wanted to bring the characters that was different? Um, we were just sort of, you know, progressing the stories that we left off. Like after the first season, Frank was still looking for a job, um, which caused financial problems within their family, so uh, maybe Sue has to work a little bit. Kevin's trying to get his band going. Bill's got a paper route, wants to play hockey. And Maureen, we're figuring out, is um, gifted as far as like how smart she is, which makes the dumb family that she's with a lot more annoying. And it was just progressing those storylines. But like we wanted, like, as crazy as the show gets, we do try to keep it with uh, tethered to reality. So I, did, I, I didn't want to have like kids cursing in front of parents without, you know, them telling, you know, knock it off or hitting them or whatever. And like, I came from that generation where you know, your parents hit, my, my dad didn't, it was just the threat of him. But like dads were scary when I was a kid. So um, like my dad come in the front door, we'd all run out the back door, or <laughs> shut off the TV and pick up a book and pretend to be reading. Um, you know, that type of stuff. So it's just, just progressing that stuff. When you got, one of the things that I love about the show, and I, I think you kind of said it, that it's tethered to reality, but as funny as the show is, you guys take seriously the storyline, specifically in the, in the second season from what I've seen, of uh, unemployment and not having money and the depression that the father, the father feels yeah. in the first episode. As much as there are jokes wrapped in all of that, it seems like you guys care very much about making sure that there's an emotional through line in the show. Yeah, well. and just how that affects kids and how, like, when you go through a financial difficult time, the oldest kid always knows, because usually there's, like, the parent starts to confide in, in, in the older kid. And then the, as it goes down, the more the kids are in the dark. Like, I was kind of in the dark when I was growing up. Like, I, didn't, I was too stupid to notice we went from our own house to a duplex and sharing it with somebody else. I was just happy we had a bigger yard. Um, but my older brother, he, he felt all of that stress. And that affected him as an, as an adult where he, he would, he understood, like, wow, man, like, you, a mom and dad can go broke. Life is hard. Like... He learned that lesson, and that shaped how he was. And I got to kind of draft behind him and still be kind of happy-go-lucky, which affected my personality. And then there was the overall, like, tensions in the house, you know, that made us kind of the same thing. So we try to have that amongst, 
you know, all the crazy jokes and the guy across the street with the coke problem and stuff, you know. So we try to have like all Sam of... Sam Rockwell. Yeah, yeah, Sam Rockwell is, is uh, uh, Vic, um, he kills it. There's so many great people. Laura Dern yeah. plays Sue. Uh, we got Haley Reinhardt, Justin Long, Debbie Derryberry. Uh, we, I don't know, I, there's just so many people like on the show that are so much more talented than I am. So that, that was the thing. I made sure I surrounded myself with a bunch of talent. How do you guys uh, beat out the show in the writer's room to make sure that you keep the jokes with that emotional through line? Do you guys come up with the storylines first and then start crafting jokes? And yeah, you do, you do the moment? overall story arc. In theory, you got to know where you're going, and then you try to keep the beats. Um, and I, I don't look at the jokes so much because those things seem to come, but like, it's just the beats. And I'm really big on, you know, um, would that happen in real life? Yeah, I'm not into like absurd. Like uh, when something's too absurd, I don't care about the characters. And there's been a lot of TV shows like that that I've liked and I've enjoyed. But like, I'm only so emotionally invested in it if everybody's sort of over the top, like bizarre behavior. You know what I mean? What's well, the difference between being able to watch one episode and being able to kind of binge watch seven or ten episodes of this, which I've found that I can do because I, I'm actually concerned with what's going to happen in the next episode oh, where these God. characters are going. Good. Yeah, that's what we were trying to do. All right, we got one. You got me. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the audience in just a minute, but I, I realize you're a big sports fan. I, uh, I'll admit I, I know nothing about sports, but I know the NBA Finals are going on right now, yeah. right? And you got to go to a game this past weekend. Yes, I did. Uh, tell me what's going on with the NBA Finals. I don't know shit. Um, the Warriors are just looking like they're going to go undefeated, and it was, uh, I think Kevin Durant is, is looking like it was the biggest free agent move ever. I've never seen a free agent move affect a league the way it did. Like last year, Golden State and Oklahoma had a, a classic seven game series and then Golden State won and then played Cleveland and had a classic seven game series. And then the best guy arguably on Oklahoma went to Golden State that effectively killed that rivalry and any sort of competition. And now they're just gonna just run the table and everybody's thumping their chests. And it's kind of like, it's like watching a movie where you already know the ending. <laughs> and everybody's shouting their lines and you're just sitting there like not giving a shit. I don't think it's good for the NBA. I think Durant is a beast, but like, I don't get how Chris Paul couldn't go to the Lakers, but he could go, maybe because it was different commissioners. It's weird, but last year was a lot more fun. But hey, God bless him if they win. You know, I hope he gets another, you know, sneaker contract, whatever the hell they're going for. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I wish it would go seven games, because after it's over, then all I got is baseball. So this, it always feels like sports claustrophobia at this time of year. And I love baseball, but the beginning of the year in October. But the dog days, it's just brutal to go from that heightened excitement of the Stanley Cup Finals and the NBA Finals to then just go to, like... It's hard to get it's into It's game a... 68 of 162, yeah. just a bit outside. Go over to someone's house, and they're watching a baseball game in the middle of July. It's, why? Let's talk. Let's, uh, what are we yeah. watching this for? Yeah, let's go help somebody move. And <laughs> maybe it'll be the third inning by the time we're done. <laughs> I hate shitting on baseball because everybody does it. I love baseball. It's a great old man sport. You can smoke a cigar and watch it. But it's just like I said, it's just that the NBA and the Stanley Cup Finals go to this crescendo of a championship. And you watch a city going nuts. And then it's just boom, over. And then you just, there's like Wimbledon, uh, I don't auto racing, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what else there is. It's, yeah, it's, the, it's a scary time. Those six weeks until you start to see preseason football for someone. If you're dope like me and you don't read and you watch other people in shape playing games against each other, um, yeah, it's a tough time. I heard you talking about the, the finals on your, on your podcast on Monday, and another thing that you actually, that you said that I'm reminded of because of, you stayed out too late last night, was that Jerry Seinfeld told you at Clusterfest this weekend to always go to, the, go to your room after Just go back show. to the room, to and I've said that to myself 90 times. Yeah, I, I'm night. on the wagon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the wagon. This is the first day of it, which is why I'm leaning like this. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, go back to the room. That's what I plan on doing. I'm going back to the room. Let, I'm no, probably going to go back to the room right after this interview. <laughs> to a comfortable chair, hopefully. Uh, no, they're not that bad. I just maybe, I don't know. Oh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question out here? Right here. How's it going, Bill? How are you, sir? Great. Um, first of all, I saw the season two, and I think it's fantastic. Thank you. But, Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, I started running lately, and I used your podcast as my 
little go-to, so it kind of helps pass the time. Oh, is that yeah. how does that work? Listening to a podcast or run, while running? Well, I love your rants when you go on rants about people. So uh -huh. my question is, what's your pet peeve about people, or biggest pet peeve? Uh, in con not being considerate and lack of empathy it drives me up the fucking wall. <laughs> you know what? I, I hate being in a, in a one of those security lines at the airport and everybody's bonding, rolling their eyes about how fucking long it takes while nobody's getting ready for their moment. <laughs> and then they go up there and become part of the problem and I, I want to beat them with that plastic tub. I literally think that they should have a moron line and a shit together line. Right onto the plane. Like there should be raised right airlines. Animals like, there's a new thing with people walking barefoot on commercial airlines into the bathroom. It's, it's the grossest thing I've ever seen. I wouldn't even take my sneakers off sitting at the, just because people have walked out. Like, what's in that rug, man? I'm telling you, you just don't want to be a part of it. So, like, I would say, like, that type of stuff. And then, you know, people, uh, you know, yeah, not being able to put themselves in other people's position. That's a sign of, uh, I'm not saying that I'm good at it, but, like, that's, that's I think, when you become a, an adult when you can do that. That's pretty good, huh? That was a good answer. Great answer. Uh, next question. Hey. Um, how are you? Good, how are you? Excellent. Um, I don't watch adult animated series. Like, I'm not going to say any names, but, like, this is the one show that I do watch. Oh, God, I thought I this was going in a bad direction. No, 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 no that's why I did it like that. No, 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 no. no. I'm very worried there. I don't I approve <laughs> of your entire genre of entertainment. No, All right, so I don't you... think, because, you, like you said, it's absurd, and I don't think, right. it, to me, it's absurd. Okay. So that being said, when you guys were, like, writing for the show, what, what were the points and the features to make you stand out? compared to the other ones? Um, well, first thing, I wasn't thinking about other shows other than I didn't want to do, you have to be familiar with what they're doing, so I didn't want to try to overlap. Yeah. So my thing was just, it was the same way that I write for my act, which is, to me, the funniest stuff to me is real stuff rather than stuff that you make up. Like I was in San Francisco recently, and I was on Market Street, which is where like all their homeless people are. And they have like next level like homeless people. Like they have, they look like like miners from the 1800s, like boxcar willy level. I don't know why I use that reference in a crowd this young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, so this guy comes riding by on a bicycle. Mexican looking dude. And he was just going like, yo, you buying, you buying, you buying as he's driving by me. And I'm just like, is he talking to me? You buying, you buying? And I was like, I went like, no, man, I'm good. I'm good. And then he addresses me using the N word. He like looked over his shoulders. He goes, yo, I'm selling pussy N word and drove away. <laughs> and to me, that's the funniest shit ever <laughs> that he used the N word to me. <laughs> And that it's a pimp on a bicycle. And I was just picturing him riding around his horse. They're going like, you got my money. And just wondering if he had the skills to like do that thing where you can stop and, and do like that. <laughs> Don't make me put my feet down. <laughs> so that's the type of shit, okay? As sad as that is, because you're dealing with human trafficking at that point. <laughs> but it's the bicycle detail that's fucking hilarious and that that's something that will stick in my head and that will, at some point, will end up on, uh, on the show. And then just all the racial thing that he used the N-word to a white guy and he looked Latino. So then I'm like trying to do the math while laughing that he's a pimp on a bicycle. So that's the type of shit that stands out to me more so than, uh, you know, what's up with Donald Trump, isn't he an idiot? Which I, you know... I appreciate that comedy, but everybody's doing it. Yeah. So I just try to stay away from that. I have long answers. I hope that answered your question. Okay, good. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Uh, I think I have time for one more question right here. Hi, Bill. Uh, Hello, I have... sir. <laughs> <laughs> this guy raised right airlines right there. I was just <laughs> goddamn eloquent. <laughs> um, a text... I... That was a textbook greeting. <laughs> Stuck the landing. <laughs> thank you. Um, I actually do watch the show and binge watched uh, season two in one night. And I was always thinking, what, what was the beginning of the catchphrase, I'll put you through that effing wall? That, that was actually, a, my dad used to say that. My dad used to say that all, no, 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 I'll put you through the fucking wall. He used to always say that. And Me he too. did say it one time when we were outside. We were outside in the yard 
and he just sort of randomly pointed towards the woods. I remember trying not to laugh because I was, you know, I was afraid of my dad. I'll put you through the fucking wall. And he's like pointing at a tree. And you're like, all right, I guess there's wood in walls. Maybe he's gonna cut that down and get some dry wood, dry wall, whatever the fuck you put up there. So that's what that, can, there's like, there's elements of the, uh, there's true stories. There's little true stories in the whole thing. Like one of the cool ones is, um, they got one of the guys that does the music, Dave Kushner, used to play in Velvet Revolver, and he, he, um, I think he wrote the theme song for, uh, what, was that, what was that motorcycle show that made all those baby boomers buy motorcycles? Chips? Not Chips, no. past that. Uh, oh, Sons, Sons of, of Anarchy. Anarchy, yeah. So he, he wrote, yeah, made guys like me buy Harleys and wear jackets like this. Um, he wrote that music. So he told me a story one time when he, he came running out of club with his gear, he had his guitar and his amp, and he was running, and he was drunk, and he tripped in the middle of the street, and not thinking his guitar and stuff was so expensive, he, he went like this, and he just face-planted and knocked out all his teeth and all his shit. He told me this story. I'm not doing it justice. I was crying laughing. So the nod to that story is that if you notice when Kevin runs out of the house in season two, you'll notice he does the same fall. And that's my nod to Dave Kushner for making me laugh the way he he did telling that story, and he just he does the face plant. I we, you do so much work. I forgot it was in there. And he texted me when he saw the episode. He was like, "Dude, is that my fucking story for the thing there?" Uh, and I couldn't remember. Then I went back and I looked at. It. I said, "Oh, that's right. That's exactly it. That's where we got that." I, um, so there, there's a bunch of, of those little things in in the uh, in the episodes this year. What about your family? When your family watches the show, do they see a lot of those stories as well? Um. I don't know that any of them have really have watched it. As far as I know, they're pretty busy, and my parents can't figure out Netflix, so. Um, but I did it in a way that, like, you know, he's not my dad, literally. He's, like, an amalgam of my dad, Mike Price's, Dave Richardson, Emily Towers, everybody's dad in the room, Vince's, you know, everybody. And so I think I respect the fact that I was dumb enough to get into this business in a way to put myself out there and all the shit that comes along with that. And I respect those who didn't. So I wanted to make this different enough that they could sit down. So he'll sit down and watch it if he remembers. And he, I'll put you through that fucking wall. He, you, know, you know parents say, oh, I never said that. Like they, yeah. they were, <laughs> he probably doesn't remember that. Complete selective memory all the time. Yeah, yeah, but um, there would be stuff that, that he would remember. And there's all those true stories. Like in the first season when... Um, when Bill's up in, the, up in the telephone pole or something like that and the bigger kids are throwing shit at him. Like, that really happened to me and another friend of mine. I mean, the kid didn't have a BB gun, but it was like rocks and stuff. Like, we were just climbing a tree and then these older kids came by, saw us up there, and they just started throwing rocks at us. <laughs> we up there hanging on crying. And uh, it was just what you did back then. <laughs> no, there, there was like no internet and that's just how people entertained themselves. And I remember coming down from the tree crying and we just kept playing and we went in the house like two hours later and I never told, you don't, didn't it, was, it was part of going outside was at some point, bigger kids were gonna come along and break your toys or beat the shit out of you. you used to hide when they would come, you'd dive under a bush or some shit. Or somehow persuade you to do something totally dangerous so that they could sit back and laugh at it while you did yep. it? Yeah, well, one of them tried to get me to throw a rock to, dared me to throw a rock into this swimming pool that was being made. They were like, this guy was down there like doing the whole <laughs> and the thing, and I wanted their approval. So I just picked, he was down there, and I just picked this big rock up, and I just went <laughs> right in it. And he was beside himself. He was just like, <laughs> just like, did you just do that? And I was just like, yes. And he goes, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I bet he still tells that story, the audacity. He's like, you want to believe it? I'm sitting there doing this. That's sort of red-headed bastard. He just fucking threw it. I swear to God, that kid's going to end up in jail. And it was because I wanted the... I thought if I did that, that they'd think I was funny and they would stop beating me up every other day. <laughs> uh, Kid Bill, logic. Kid logic. It's been a pleasure talking to you. F is for Family is on Netflix. Uh, That's second right. Second season is on Netflix right now. Ten yep. episodes. Go watch. If you haven't seen the first, watch the first season. It's there you go. a great show. Uh, you're the Monday morning podcast every morning. You can That's find right. it on iTunes, right? That's it. That's is that. anything else, anything I'm missing that you want to? Um, I think that's it. Okay. Sum me up as a person. <laughs> that's all I go got. Go Burr, people. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>